Every team, every topic, everywhere, this is Believe. Welcome in to another edition of the Jamie Sports News Podcast. I am Bennett Conlon, joined by Jack Fitzpatrick. A lighter load this week for us to discuss, but still plenty going on in the Jamie Sports world. Still important nonetheless. Don't worry, guys. We're back. We had two episodes last week. And this week, after we've taken that deep breath, I feel like I haven't seen Bennett's face in such a long time. Yeah, what an emotional waiver week. And uh, now we're back. Now we're just sort of cruising through spring sports. Yeah, nothing really changed, except for that bet online. Well, I guess this hasn't really changed. Bet online is still your number one source for all of your basketball info, stats, news, and scores. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest player reports for this year's pro basketball playoffs. BetOnline is always your sports information destination this season as they have you covered for all of your sports wagering needs. Basketball, MLB, NHL hockey, right down to UFC and boxing. Folks, even golf. You can bet on the Wells Fargo Championship happening just 15 15 minutes away from where I'm sitting at Quail Hollow. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to get all of your betting info, including live betting options and your favorite casino and card games you can play right from the comfort of your couch. Head to the website today. That website is betonline.ag or use your mobile device to go to betonline.ag and get in on the action. Be sure to use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B L E A V, to receive your 50% welcome bonus. On your first deposit, you want to get in on the action, throw down a $100 first time deposit when you sign up with promo code BLEAV and they'll get you credited with a $50 free bet. So head online to betonline.ag where the game starts. Can you bet on Alabama baseball? Uh, you tell me, mister. You tell me. I don't know. Can you? Apparently, you, you know what you can bet on? Charlotte baseball futures. Hell yeah, man. I feel like maybe they're maybe they got something brewing after that win over Coastal. I'm, I mean, a uh, win over number eight Coastal. The thing about this Charlotte baseball team is they've beaten Dallas Baptist and UTSA this year, both ranked opponents. They beat South Carolina, a ranked opponent. They beat Coastal. They've competed well with Virginia Tech in the Friday game of that series. They just got swept by Western Kentucky though, and they're they're a weird team, man. Like, they have the guys that they could, but they just have to get hot and stay hot for a full Conference USA tournament. Uh, Not saying they can't do it, but it is very difficult if the 49ers want to win the Conference USA championship. And here we are starting off the Jamie Sports News podcast, (laughs) talking Charlotte baseball. That's that's great work by us. (laughs) Really good. Where do you want to start today? Where do you want to go? I think we start – so we, we have a jam-packed slate. Not really jam-packed at all. We only have like five lower thirds, and normally we're running with like 15. Um, so we can start with former Dukes getting their NFL opportunities, kind of recap the draft. Uh, JMU men's basketball, they added a few transfers. I don't think we've really talked about a lot of the additions they've had. Uh, maybe last episode we touched on it, but we can kind of dive into it a little bit more. JMU women's basketball, they had a few transfers. Lacrosse keeps winning and a Diamond Dukes update. You tell me where you want to start. Let's start. We were talking baseball. Let's do a really quick little baseball guy. Your portion in the newsletter, I think, summed it up extremely well that this team doesn't make a lot of sense. They're just like a good, mediocre team. And by that, I mean they can sweep Louisiana Mm -hmm. and then they can fall on their face. It's a little tough. They're toward the bottom of the Sun Belt and RPI, which is frustrating. They play Virginia uh, tonight as we're recording on Wednesday in about 20 minutes. It's a Virginia team that's kind of scuffling. So maybe an opportunity on the road there to pick up a, a big one. But like App State's not that good. Um, and they, they went in there and lost that series, won one of the three games over the weekend. They play Marshall this weekend. Marshall's not great. But then ODU and Georgia Southern to end the year are much better. So it's I don't know what to make of them. I think Eikenberry's probably getting another year, which we discussed, barring any horrible finishes, horrible finish. But they're they're 24, 19, 9, 10 overall. Big game against Virginia. But it's it's a little bit frustrating, you know. We said that time and time again that they haven't 
taken advantage of it. And I think the worst part is that I bought into it. I bought into some of the hype after the Louisiana sweep and, and nearly beaten Virginia tech. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to give them a chance against app state, like win that series, win the Marshall series. And yeah, you're really building some stuff. Instead they lose that series. And, uh, it's just they can never get any momentum over like a seven-year span. So that's a little bit frustrating as a fan. And uh, they're going to have a tough finish out to their schedule um, after this weekend series at Marshall. Marshall's currently RPI 172, so that should be a winnable series. But they are 8-12 and 12 on the road, so nothing is a certain. Um, they then head right on the road to face off against Old Dominion, one of the best power-hitting teams in the Sun Belt. They are an RPI of 60, so that may be a sweep um, for the Monarchs in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Then after that, it doesn't get much easier. They're on the road against Georgia Southern, which is RPI 70 right now, and split in between that is a midweek against Virginia Tech at home. So this season, it is teetering right now. It is tw- They are 24-19, 9-10 in conference play, but depending on how these final three weekends go, it can get ugly pretty quickly, um, which is insane because there was all that hope after the Louisiana sweep, even the hope after the close loss against Virginia Tech. But if JMU baseball wants to be a force, not only in the Sun Belt, but in the state of Virginia, you can't be hanging your hat on close losses against Virginia Tech. That is a midweek you should win. That is a midweek you have to win if you want to be considered uh I think what JMU wants to be considered, and that is an elite baseball school. And now they have to put kind of the money where their mouth is, and they have to go out there and try and get better because where this program is, they are currently hanging their hat on a close loss against Virginia Tech, which is unacceptable. Yeah, like if you're not going to beat them, like, well, you better not lose a series to UMass Lowell or give up 19 runs to Maryland. Like there's just so many things that they've done. Or lose to App State or – Right. And it's, I can it's guarantee worth- you they're going to lose this week. They're going to lose. They're going to pick up a game against Marshall probably Friday or Saturday, and then lose the rubber match. You got to get. You got to at least get two there because they're so the top ten teams out of the fourteen team Sun Belt make the conference tournament. Jamie's currently eleventh in the standings. There's a gigantic tie um, above Jamie with teams who are eleven and ten in conference. Jamie's nine and ten. Maybe if they get those Arkansas State games that got rained out there, <laughs> maybe they're right there. But they're not right now. They're 9 and 10. They're in 11. So if they don't make a push here late in the season, that's embarrassing to me, right? Not making your conference tournament is embarrassing. <laughs> so that's that's one, like, at the very least. And if you want to bring Eikenberry back, I don't know. I feel like you got you to gotta qualify for the league tournament. Yeah. Um, also, for everyone tuning into the live stream currently, we threw this question out on Twitter. We're not a question. If you have any questions, uh, be sure to drop them wherever you're listening in the comments, uh, in the Twitter replies, or head on over and just add us on Twitter, and we'll be sure to read out any questions. If you have a question about why does baseball stink, I'm happy to dive into a 15-minute soapbox about it. But um, So we'll, we'll leave baseball on that note, though. Yes, we will. Softball, if you want to hit them quickly, pretty solid weekend. Did a nice job taking care of business against App State. Uh, Hannah Shiflett had a nice weekend, her senior day and her senior weekend, which was good for her. She's one who was on the Women's College World Series team, but primarily played defense and then really took a step later in her career as a batter. Uh, One that I think probably could have transferred after the season, been a grad transfer, played at like a Power 5 school that was going to make the NCAA tournament. She did not. And I'm glad she stayed. I think Jamie fans are, are glad, too. She pl- played really well a year. So it was cool to see her sort of end her home career like that. Um, you know, barring a, a really special run in the Sun Belt Championship, Jamie will not play in the NCAA tournament. But they've had a fine year. They're a decent team trending forward. And I think, um, you know, Shiflet's one who will probably go down. That's one of the memorable Jamie players, at least in recent years. Um, especially having been on the Women's College World Series team. That's certainly a historic piece of JMU softball history. Yeah, and it's a team that the future looks really bright. They've shown all of these great players that are around and they will be there for the next few years. They have some awesome recruits coming up. And this is a team that I think is a little bit ahead of schedule from where we expected them preseason, uh, sitting at 27 and 16 currently. And the future looks bright for them. So it's exciting 
to see how they're going to finish out this season and how they're going to go into next season with KK Mathis having another year of off season with them. Uh, Alyssa Humphrey, I believe she got injured a few weeks ago, but she'll be returning from injury next year to bolster that rotation. Uh, and then all of their recruits they have coming in. I know they've been hyping up a few of the recruits in this incoming class for the last year or two. Yeah, they've got some good young players, which is nice. I guess we'll keep it in the spring sports. Lacrosse keeps winning, yet they keep falling in the polls. I've been tweeting about this. They don't want to see the Dukes uh, thrive. This is the DJ Khaled, like, circa 2016, whenever he was on Snapchat, talking about they don't want you to, to, to succeed. That This is the same day, folks. They don't want to see JMU women's lacrosse win another national title. They were humiliated the last time JMU won the national title, and they don't want to see it happen again. So instead of rewarding the Dukes for winning in dominant, dominant fashion against bad uh, opponents in the American, they're punishing them by having them fall. They were in fourth two weeks ago. They're in sixth now, and all they've done between then and now is win. Yeah, it's, it's tough. They'll probably be a top eight seed. I love their chances going into the tournament. I think the RPI, when I last checked, they were right around six, two. But, man, they've been they've been unreal all season. They lost the season over to UNC, have not lost since 16 in a row, which is a program record for consecutive wins. They're so good. Shelly Clays has them, has them rolling again. No surprise there. It's, uh, it's another team that I think probably is – they're probably the best athletic program, right, within JMU in terms of consistency. We, we had this discussion a few weeks ago. I yeah. think women's lacrosse is by far the best program in all of JMU athletics. They're cruising. I'm excited. They're, it's only like 10 days, maybe less than 10 days now, from the start of the NCAA tournament. They've got the, yep. the conference tournament this week. Yep, so they take on Cincinnati, who is the four seed in the American Athletic Conference Championship, tomorrow, May 4th at 4.30 p.m. in Philly. And then if they win that game, they'll play on Saturday at noon, against whoever wins in the other semifinals. Um, it is assumed, you, you could probably assume it's going to be Florida, uh, but crazier things have happened. Dukes, though, would probably prefer Florida to make it so that they can make two statement victories. They can blow out Cincinnati, who they already beat 17-8 to back on April 16th. If they can blow them out again and then blow out a ranked, I believe Florida is still ranked, blow out a ranked Florida team, that is probably their only path to get a top four seed and then have some chaos happen on top of them. Yeah, they still might be locked in in that below area. I think the ACC already wrapped up theirs or something. But if they get in the top four, they'll be sweet. But even if they don't, lock it in the top eight will be a huge, huge deal. And they, they feel like even at six, like you'd be a national title threat even at, at six. Yeah, I, I would I would say that. Um. If they're a top four seed, they will host until the final four, until the semifinals. Uh, if they aren't in the top four, they'll host the first and second round and then travel for the quarters. And then the semis are at a neutral site. Hell yeah. They also won a bunch of awards today. Isabella Peterson was oh, so the many. American Athletic Conference Attack Player of the Year. Mabry Durkin, Defensive Player of the Year. And then they don't do Coach of the Year. They do Coaching Staff of the Year, which That's went cool. to JMU. I actually kind of like that. It's it's a little like participation trophy esque, right? Where I can see people be like, "Oh, what do you give to all the coaches?" But I I kind of I kind of dig that. Where they like other leagues, like other sports, just give you like head coach of the year, and the assistants are just back there grinding away. So it's it's <laughs> the cool assistants quite literally are doing like ninety nine percent of the work, watching the film, putting together the scouting reports, and meanwhile the head coach is like, "This trophy is pretty nice, guys. Do you want I one? Did this. <laughs> Too bad, it's mine." I love that they got that. So from here, do you want to go continue just working reverse chronologically and do winter sports next or go from fall to winter? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Uh, that, e that was an either or question, do, not a yes do, or no. Let's do quick football and then we'll hit on the basketball portal. I feel like <laughs> that's a good way to end. Do you want to do this or that? Yep. I want to do it. <laughs> I heard it wrong in my head. I thought you just said winter twice. I was like, yeah, I mean, if you really want to do winter. <laughs> um, so JMU football had no one drafted, unfortunately. Uh, but that was kind of to be expected. The only person that you could kind of think maybe had a shot at getting drafted 
was Santeo late in the seventh, much like how Danucci and Moreland both were kind of snagged yeah. right near the end. But didn't I think what was surprising to me was Santeo didn't even get signed as an undrafted free agent. Yeah, so he has a rookie minicamp tryout with the Chiefs. Which I don't want to be extremely negative. It is very, very tough to get a contract out of those. We've seen yes. a lot of JMU players get these, um, and I don't think we've seen a single one result in a contract right away. Sometimes you'll see them kind of result in something in a few weeks, like an injury starts settling in and they need yeah. to bolster their practice squad. Then you'll see these guys who had the experience come in. But it's not often they get signed right away out, out of this. It's tough. I think on the bright side for him, the land, like the team is good. Like that's de- <laughs> it's definitely one where like, um, like you're trying to wiggle your way into be Patrick Mahomes backup. Sounds pretty cool. Uh, a long way to go to get to that spot. But yeah, that he's, that he's in with them in some capacity is cool. And then I guess you had a trio of receivers also get some similar mini camp invites, which is a little bit surprising. I will say to have like, I think Terrence Green's with the Jets. Um, to see like him have a mini camp and then the same level be Santeo, who seemed throughout the pre-draft process to almost be a shoe in to get like undrafted free agent or um, or drafted. Yeah, it's a little bit of a surprise at least. Yeah, Chris Thornton went got a mini camp invite with the Ravens and Devin Ravenel also got a mini camp invite with the Ravens and then as you said Terrence Green Jr. With the Jets, Jordan Swan uh, with the Ravens as well. So Baltimore really bolstering up on some God, they love it. <laughs> Is this like, remember when the XFL 1.0 a few years ago, like had Vadley and like three yeah. other JMU players and it came out that like the strategy for these teams in that draft was to just try and bulk up on one school so that you could get their fan base bought in. I, I do remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if the Ravens are like, I wonder if we just sign a bunch of these like semi-local kids who play just down the road. If all of a sudden we'll get all their fans to be fans of us. Um, I like that. I like the idea that the the Ravens are in need of fans and they're like, God, what if is there like a rising group of five team that we get? Oh, they're purple. They got <laughs> <laughs> They probably got all the same stuff. We don't have to give them gear. Um, Kind of surprising for me is the fact that Percy has not received any mini camp invite. Um, The odds may have been kind of stacked against him, an older running back who had a history of injuries. But after talking with him with his interview a few weeks ago, we had him on the podcast. He was getting prepared for any type of opportunity. He was talking about how, a uh, few teams had been in contact with him about it, what, it, being interested in him post draft and potentially signing him then or getting any rookie mini camp invites. So I'm kind of surprised that he hasn't even received a mini camp invite. Yeah, I am as well. Hopefully he gets he he gets something here in the future because he's a he's a good player. He's one I'd like to at least see at um I don't know. I think a lot of these guys like. A lot of former Jamie players who haven't gotten NFL opportunities have gone on to play in some of those other leagues. So I'm interested to see if, if anybody pops on to one of those teams in the next like one to three years, because like Danucci was one of the stars and like faces of with the sea dragons. And what is that? The XFL? Yeah, buddy. So he's there. I know Rondell Carter's playing in the USFL. Well, Bad Lee has played in pretty much every league there. There is the dudes on, <laughs> he played in the moment you could call your own plays. I think he's in the USFL now. Like oh, he's he, done. Everything. He did play the that that call your own football thing. Yeah, so I mean there's um, opportunities out there for guys. I was gonna make a joke, but I completely forgot what it was. I'm pulling up the rest of the seniors from last season. Oh, I wrote about on the website, Shameless Plug, potential draft picks in 2023. It seems like to me going into the season, it's probably Nick Kidwell and then like a bunch of other guys, if they have a huge year, could put themselves on the board. I feel like Kidwell is one who actually has a chance. Offensive lineman. He's had, got 30 plus starts already. He was second team all Sun Belt last year. 6'5, 315 tackle, but you could move him to guard. That seems like the kind of path where it's like, oh, okay, he could actually get, get picked. 
that was sort of my estimation. I don't know if you think there's any other guys to to keep a close eye on next year for the draft. Yeah, I think next year probably not. I think there are a few guys in the pipeline. Mm-hmm. I think at the linebacker position, we may be able to see some of them that they'll either have them bulk up and try and get the edge position or, or see how that goes. Um, I think Chauncey Logan has a chance to be drafted in a few years if he continues his his rise. I also think the move to the Sun Belt, and, and I know we've talked about it before, but I don't think we've put enough focus on it. There were Sun Belt guys getting drafted in like the fifth round mm-hmm. that I saw and I was like, JMU played that team. He did not jump off the screen to me by like at all. And he's getting drafted in the fifth round. And I think it's because he had four years of tape against FBS opponents where now that JMU is going to be playing more and more Sunbelt, which is another reason why I think a lot of these guys didn't transfer during that open window mm-hmm. because they have a lot of el- years of eligibility left. And the end goal for a lot of these guys is to try and take that next step into the NFL and when you have all of those years of tape against FBS opponents, it seems like it goes a lot farther because it was shocking to me that Centeo didn't get an undrafted free agent deal. It's, it's shocking to me that Percy didn't. Re- We've never really seen a JMU running back, and they've had some fantastic ones land in the NFL, probably because a lot of their tape is against FCS opponents. I think that's a lot of it. I think some of it too is they've they've done a good job with this, so it's not a fault of theirs. But some of these guys are coming out and they're like 25 years old. So I think if you're an NFL team, you're like, I'm not going to draft a 25 year old like developmental prospect. I'm probably looking yeah. for like a. And Uku actually said this in an interview this spring <laughs> uh, to Dave Rigger, but, but well before the transfer was announced, was like, yeah, like an, if an NFL team wants me, they want like a very finished product because I'm 25. Like <laughs> it's like <laughs> it was very aware of like I'm old and have had ACL injuries. Like they need to know that I'm ready to play like immediately. So I think that. Maybe that's part of it because they've had some running backs that have been around for like that's true six years at times. But it's interesting to see if that'll help. I know the group of five kind of got clobbered with no first round picks for the first time in a very long time. They only had two guys in the second round. So there was a, a dip in NFL draft picks, but at the end of the draft, nine Sun Belt guys were picked. Not not too bad. Now there were 10 guys picked from Alabama <laughs> draft, but like you can get drafted in the Sun Belt, like you were saying, even if your team, you don't have to be like winning the FCS national championship, right? You don't have to be a. a I think Sunbelt you have a better contender. chance at getting drafted out of the Sun Belt if you're on Arkansas State than you do if you won the FCS national title. Agree. You had three ODU guys were picked. There was one of them doing his rounds and like the, the pre draft process was on Good Morning Football. What? <laughs> Tell me the last time you saw a JMU tight end on Good Morning Football during the pre-draft process. I'll wait. I have all day. <laughs> we destroyed ODU. What do you mean? How? What? It is pretty fascinating. I mean, it was like that. Remember that year Rhode Island sent three guys to the combine? <laughs> oh, yeah. That was dumb. But I do think <laughs> they're, they're, they're getting closer to having some guys who will be picked. So I think it'll it'll matriculate here in the next few years. Nice word. Nice word. And talking about matriculating things down the hardwood, Jimmy men's basketball has added a few transfers, um, all of which I think will make an immediate impact. And watch me just completely eat my words on that because uh, I'm so reminded that I thought Joel Ensa would be the CAA player of the year. (laughs) Oh my god. But they, they have gotten I didn't have to laugh so them? hard at that. Are you pleased with some of the size that they've added here? Did we talk about Bickerstaff last time? I can't remember. We and we let, let's go over them. I just pulled up the portal tracker on jamiesportsnews.com. They've yeah. added Michael Green the third, a point guard yes. from Bryant and Robert Morris. TJ Bickerstaff, uh the forward from Drexel, but spent last year at Boston College. Last week we talked about how Quincy Allen visited. On the day of the sp- the day of the spring game, he did sign. He is another forward wing type out of Colorado. Long, tall. I think he's six six eight or six nine. I think he is six eight. But I think they'll be fine. Um, I think they're putting a lot of stock in Roberson, and I think you can tell that because Amadi transferred out. 
I think Amadi mm-hmm. stays if he isn't told that his minutes will be cut. Whether that is from Bickerstaff, Quincy Allen, or Roberson, I think it, it shows that Amadi wasn't in the future plans at the four or five. I think there's probably, yeah, probably an understanding that some of those, those additions were going to cut into his opportunity. And, and he kind of lost a little bit with like Mezzi and stuff. So that checks out. I also think the part that maybe goes, oh, no, no, no overlooked. Underlooked. Yeah. Underlooked's not a thing, right? So the part that goes overlooked because you're not looking at it. Yep. I, that happened in my brain five <laughs> seconds. <laughs> I was like, what is the word? But anyway, the part that goes overlooked is like, Julian Wooden was really good last year and he's 6'8. Like, if he can score, like, he kind of has to play at times, where that's another thing for Amadi. Like, if Amadi's not, wasn't getting you like 10 rebounds a game, um, he can't score like Wooden can because he doesn't have like a three point shot and things like that. So it's hard. It's just kind of hard to break in when they've got some, some depth. And it sounds like they're trying to add a little more. Yes. So Shane Metlin has been very on top of the basketball portal to the extent where like he writes an article and it's like, they're looking at these guys. And then three days later, like they tweet a graphic of themselves in a JNU Jersey and they commit. So he he has said that the coaching staff um, is very confident that a certain player will likely commit to them. And they're operating as if they have one scholarship on an unrelated note or related note, college of Charleston guard, Raekwon Horton has been consistently linked to the Dukes. He has visited the school, posted photos of himself on social media in a Jamie uniform, but is not committed anywhere yet. So like maybe Raekwon Horton, who is a, I think he's a six, five or six, six wing who came off the bench for the college of Charleston only averaged like five points a game last year um, is a potential option for them and adds good depth at the wing. He wouldn't necessarily have to play a lot, but like it's a college of Charleston team that made the NCAA tournament last year and he was getting some time for him. So certainly not a bad addition. No, I don't. I don't hate it. I, I do still worry that we are going to have this discussion after the Sun Belt semis or the Sun Belt championship, and we go, "Man, if only they had a big that could just dominate the paint." Now, I could be very wrong on this entire thing. Bickerstaff could be that. You I know, Wood, that. Wooden could potentially fill that role. Heck, Roberson, we've never seen him play extended minutes. He could be that. So, I could be very wrong on this. I just. When you look at the roster and you go, we still don't have anyone over 6'9". You're like, uh, well, that's a bummer, right? Like, that that stinks. Uh, there's not a lot of size there. Although I will say Horton, 6'6", 215, looks a little little thicker. Um, that's, a, that's a thicker 215, so he can do some stuff on the wing, you would assume, if he actually does come. And you said you think bigger staff might be a 10-10 10 10 type of guy. In his last year at the mid-major level, he averaged 10 and 5. I think so. And then it was either last year or the year before at Boston College, he averaged like 7 rebounds. So it seemed like he got better as a rebounder. If you can do that against ACC teams, I feel like you could hold your own in the Sun Belt. And then I'm seeing mixed mix things on the size of a certain player. So I'm just trying Which to get, player? Uh, so Shane Metlin wrote in his story... Uh, The nature of high school recruiting, the focus of many high major programs on immediate impact transfers could allow the Dukes to aim high on high school recruits as a Jordan Burks. But then it says he's a 6'10 guard, doesn't totally check out, from Florida who decommitted from Ole Miss. I think he might be 6'7. Where'd those three inches go? I was trying, because I was about to get you all excited about the 6'10 guy. I think that might be a typo. I'll, I'll I'll patiently wait. I, I think he's six seven, a six <laughs> seven small forward. So it's minor correction there, unless he grew three inches. But he's not. They're listing him if he's listing him as a guard. I think he's got more like wing potential than he does uh, center. It's it's interesting because I will say last year it seemed like they got Mezzi and they're like, all right, we're good in the portal. We got our big. He's six eight. We're let's go. Let let's run it back. And this year, they've added Quincy Allen, 6'8". They added Bickerstaff, 6'9". They're potentially adding a 6'6 guy. They're potentially adding a 6'7 guy. Where it seemed like last year, they they got their one big, and they're like, all right, we're just going to get a bunch of guards now. We're going to get five guards in the portal, and 
just figure out what a rotation is when we have 15 threes and 15, like we have 15 point guards. Let's figure this out. I do like the way they are attacking it. I do wish they got a little bit bigger, but I understand you're, you're no offense to the Sun Belt. You're a low major. Uh, it, it's, mm-hmm. you haven't won the Sun Belt. You haven't won the CAA since Byington took over. It's, it's kind of a hard sell to tell a guy like, come here and you'll have an opportunity at the postseason when they haven't played in the NCAA tournament since 2014. So like it's it's a hard recruiting sell to a transfer who's either who's either leaving a power five, a power six school, and he's gonna try and go down to the mid major and you're like a low major, like the little mm-hmm. brother yelling at him, like, come play with me, come play with me. I swear it'll be a fun time. And he's like, back it up, and they're like, well, I got a sandbox. And he's like, I don't really play in those anymore. Like, that's what JMU is right now. And I think they one day will be great. All of this to say is maybe my expectations were too high that they'd get a 7-2 guy like Oral Roberts got. Like a 7-2 contributor? That guy's back in the portal. He is. I, I haven't said anything. The 7-6 <laughs> guy from Oral Roberts, although he did go to Oral Roberts because of religion. So if he goes to Liberty, I wouldn't be shocked. I do say I think it'll be interesting with, like, let's say you run Edwards as like a point forward. You could do a lineup that's like Terrence Edwards, Noah Friedel, Julian Wooden, Quincy Allen and Bickerstaff, which is like you're not going under six four, and then you've got six eight, six eight, six nine. Yeah. The, so like the they, way, they could have some like total size. Yeah, I was gonna the way they've put together this transfer class makes it where at times their five on the floor will be the tallest in the Sun Belt. But their overall roster will not be near the top of the Sun Belt. Does that make sense? Like, like you said, there could be a time where the average height of a guy on the floor is six yes. five, where the average height of the other team might be six three because they have a five ten point guard out there yeah. with a six nine. So, like, so there might be their average size might be fine. I just really worry about because in that South Alabama game, we got on this podcast and we said they lost that game in the off season when they didn't get a big in the portal. Mm-hmm. And I could be very wrong with all of this, but I just feel like if we run into a seven foot, 230 pound guy like we did with Kevin Samuel, he will feast on the low block again. Yeah, they got to come up with a plan for it. So whether it's Roberson takes a step, Bakerstaff is a good post defender, we'll find out. But that's that's kind of the key off season question for him. And I, I still stand by my take that I think uh, Jason Crack and the athletic department need to just round up with Roberson on the roster. Like, just say that he grew two inches in his 6'11". No one's checking that. Just say that he's 6'11". Say it, that would make me so happy. it would make me right? so happy. It would make me so happy. Up. Be like, put him in shoes and then put him on, like, a stool. <laughs> Let's <laughs> just get a random seven-footer. Let's get a random seven-footer. Yeah, that's they got Ben Hall, right, the walk-on freshman at 6'10". Just say – there's no reason not to say that he's a seven-foot-tall player. <laughs> and then, like, leak to the press that, like, he's showing something in practice. And then, like, before game one, be like, he rolled his ankle, he's out for the year. But just give me, give me, throw me a bone. Give me hype. Give me, give me, give, 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 please make me excited. I am really, I do prefer this transfer class a lot more than last year's. I think they'll all make an immediate impact. And I think it adds elements to a rotation that needed the elements. I think so, too. I think so. And Olivia Mullins, what up? Welcome to the program. Let's have some Joe's fun. Point guard, St. Joe's point guard. Last year, she started, I think it's 31 games for St. Joe's, if I'm not mistaken. Let me double check here. Yes, 31 games, played 30 minutes a game for a team that played in the WNIT. 8.4 points a game, three assists. She had a positive assist to turnover ratio. She's played a lot of basketball over the last few years. In total, she's played over 1,600 minutes, which means absolutely nothing to the casual fan, which is why I'm saying it. It doesn't mean anything to me. Sounds like a lot. It is. So she, she's an experienced point guard who essentially can come in and replace Jermon. So that, yeah. I think that's actually a sneaky big ad. Oh, that's a, that's a massive ad because yeah. if you ask me what kind of the biggest loss this offseason was, outside of Kiki Jefferson, of course, you know, one of the greatest players of all time in women's basketball history, it was Jermon because their issue two years ago when they didn't have that go-to point guard was extremely high turnover numbers. Then you brought in Jermon and just having that kind of steady presence to lead your offense 
really made that thing go. And where Jermon was off, the team was off. And when Jermon wasn't on the floor, sometimes the turnovers got a little bit out of hand. So being able to bring in a point guard that is that steady presence is absolutely massive for the Dukes. Yeah, I'm looking forward to see what they they do. They had a couple other players leave, and I know Claire Neff retired from basketball, according to some of Shane's reporting. So I think they've still got a little wiggle room to add some players if they want. We'll see what they end up doing there. But they should be a Sunbelt contender, Peyton McDaniel, Kozlova. Now you've got Mullins at point. Hazel is one that, like, he gave her some extra shots. I'm good with that. Kobe king Hawaii. <laughs> good work. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, they'll be good again next year. Yeah. I'm, I, this isn't to take anything away from Kiki Jefferson. Again, one of the greatest players that we've seen in the last 20 years. Fantastic player. This team, to me, should be the favorite to win the Sun Belt still. I think so. I think McDaniel's that good and the players around her are that good. And with an offseason, knowing you'll be without Kiki, yes. Peyton McDaniel can, get more minutes as a starter. Kobe King Hawaii is just elite level turnaround jumper in the mid range. Work on that. And 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 Hazel Hazel starred in that Ohio State game. So if she could take that, her issue's kind of been at times um a little bit of inconsistency. So if she can get consistent, she's one of the best downhill players this team has. And when you have that going with a pick and pop out to Peyton McDaniel, who's one of the best shooters in the Sun Belt, this team can be scary good next year. 100%. I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful. Right. Well, anyways. we got some listener questions. Well, oh, hit. Two, two from, from CLNOGZ, CL Nogs. First question Portal rumblings? Portal rumblings? Which um, basketball, we just hit the portal rumblings. Football. Portal rumblings. Nothing. One of the UConn guys, they were looking at a receiver committed to Cincinnati, so that stinks. Uh, they got another one they're looking at. They're looking at some defensive linemen. So we'll see if uh, they make any moves there. Not a ton of rumblings. Although, worth pointing out, you said, you were like, everybody calm down. JMU's not going to have this mass exodus in the transfer portal after not getting the waiver. That appears to be true. High five to us. High five to us. Good call. Um, the other question from, I always thought it was C.I. Nogs. Oh, like a capital I? Yeah, but it could be L. It looks like an L in the in the yeah. handle. Hey, not at C.L. Nogs. Really yeah. L- let us know, please. Um, <laughs> how much to read into Keith Gill's excited for Jimmy to represent us in the postseason in the future comments? I have a hard time believing the Sun Belt doesn't ride with JMU on this. I don't think they want the bad look of last year as a possibility possibility again it's really a no lose for them um is the question do you think sunbelt will back jmu to try and get them this waiver after it's been denied i think the sunbelt could change the bylaws to let him play in the sunbelt championship game the sunbelt does not want that though i understand you i understand what you're saying like cl nogs like i, I get kind of the sentiment behind it but the Sun Belt doesn't want JMU in their championship game if they can't go to the best possible bowl. And there, yeah. there's a pot like JMU is quote unquote bowl eligible, but they are bowl ineligible. Remember that. So they have to have everything go right for them. They have right. to then become bowl eligible. And then a bowl has to pick them from a qualifying bowl. Like even if JMU goes 12 and one this season, which I don't even know is possible with the, Sunbelt Championship game. Like, it's not a foregone conclusion that the Cotton Bowl will come calling. Right, because you have to, the way it's written, you have to be the highest group of five champion to get into that game, highest ranked group of five champion. And technically, so you, they wouldn't be. So they would, Sunbelt would have to change it, let them play in that game. They would have to win that game. But, but Jamie would still be technically bowl ineligible. And then they would also, and I don't know, no one's, I haven't seen anything on this. Like, if there's those open spots, does that mean it could be the Cotton Bowl? My understanding was that it would be like a lower tier bowl. Same, because they're technically still bowl ineligible, and to me, like that takes off all all New Year's Six bowls. I also think this is an interesting question in general, and it's probably worth noting. Like Keith Gill's job is not to like ride for JMU; it's to like ride for the Sun Belt as a whole. Yeah. In any situation that like 
I honestly like Keith Gill behind the scenes is probably rooting for JMU to win every game except for like at Troy. Have them be like this great team, have Troy win the Sun Belt, have Troy get into um the New Year's Six Bowl. Yeah. Like it's it's they just want a team in the New Year's Six. They want their teams in bowl games, <laughs> winning bowl games, representing the league well. It's not there's not really that much of a of a love for like, hey, we gotta get JMU in. They kinda already rode for JMU helping yes. waiver. Yeah, one hundred percent. And and yeah. Was there another question? Uh, he asked if anyone had toured the convo renovation. I have not, but also interested to see what like the volleyball facility will look like. Slash yes. looks like. Same. So for Bennett Conlin, my name's Jack Fitzpatrick, presented by Bet Online. Thank you for listening to Believe. You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube.